name is Lisa Kochikmeyer. I'm the Director of Planning for the City of Sugarland. And I must say it's really, uh, really exciting and really refreshing to see a lot of people coming out this evening um, to share your thoughts and uh, feedback on where we're at with the land use plan update. Um, the, really that is the purpose of tonight's meeting is to get your feedback. We've gone along this process for about a year and a half now. And uh, along the way, we've been um, encouraging people to give their input and feedback. And it's really uh, great that you all came out this evening uh, to do that. Um, so before I start the formal part of the presentation, I do want to do a little bit of introductions because we've been working with a lot of people, um, both uh, citizens in the community as well as uh, our city council members. And I would like to recognize Joe Zimmerman, uh, council member for the city of Sugarland, as well as Amy Mitchell. They both joined us here this evening, so thank you for doing that. I'd also like to recognize our Land Use Advisory Committee members that are here with us this evening. This is our citizen group that have been working with us uh, over the last couple of years on this project. So I'll just go down the line as I see you. I have Julia Mickham here, Ravi Aurora, Heather Davis, Bob Ring, and who else? Debbie Kaufman, I saw you. Right there, Debbie Kaufman, yes, and Carolina Serratos over here. And did I miss anybody that snuck in at the end? No, okay, well, really appreciate uh, these members of, of the community um, participating in this process along the way. So with that, um, really tonight, um, we'll do a brief um, introduction presentation for you. Um, just to give those that maybe haven't been involved in the process so far, just a brief update on uh, the purpose of the project, what we're focusing on, and then we'll also outline uh, different ways that you can give uh, your feedback this evening. Um, we'll do a project overview. Um, we will go over the draft uh, vision, goals, and land use policies that have been drafted to date that we want to get your feedback on this evening. We'll also talk a little bit about next steps. And then we'll adjourn to the lobby, and uh, there are stations uh, in the lobby um, with all of the land use policies, and there will be uh, staff members, and there will be advisory committee members uh, that will all be there to take your feedback and answer any questions you may have. With that, I'm going to turn it over now to Christoph Spieler, who is our consultant that um, has been working with us on this project with Morse Architects. Um, so with that, Christoph. So I want to start today by talking about the sort of time frame we're dealing with on this project. This project is not about a specific ordinance change. It is not about a specific development that might be built next year. The, the city has processes for these. There are developments moving forward. City Council is considering various policies. What this really is about is the long-term picture. This is really intended to be the framework that will guide land use policy in Sugar Land for decades to come. And this is part of the comprehensive plan. This will be a chapter in the city's comprehensive plan that will really guide all of the decisions that the city makes regarding land use. And that's what's really critical about this, is what we're trying to do is we're really trying to pull together all the different ways in which the city makes decisions that impacts the kind of places you live, the kind of places you shop, the kind of places you work that impacts the city's tax base and the long-term financial sustainability of the city and really look at all of that comprehensively to be the guideline where planning and zoning can make decisions on projects, where city council can pass specific ordinances and move forward specific projects. And if we start talking about that kind of time frame, if we start talking about a 25 or 30 year time frame, we have to realize how much a city can change in that time frame. This is Sugar Land in the 1980s, at a point where those empty fields, those are now supermarkets and hospitals and new residential areas. At that point, there were still empty spaces in between the city of Sugar Land and Houston, where you would drive down the freeway and see undeveloped land that's obviously all developed today. So if you look at this, and then look at where we are right now and think about the magnitude of change we have seen in those 30 years. Realize that the city can change as much again in the next 30. And what this plan is about is really thinking about what that change should be. And so the question we're asking is what kind of city should Sugarland be 25 years from today? 
And that's a really important question, and it's a really big question. And like Lisa said, we've been at this for two years now. One of the first acts was the constitution of the Land Use Advisory Committee, which is really residents of Sugar Land, citizens of Sugar Land, representing neighborhoods from all over the city, people who have been involved in their neighborhoods and who have a long-term commitment to the city. And we've put them through an awful lot of hours of meetings, a lot of discussion at a very detailed level. And everything you see here tonight has really been vetted by that group. And I'll tell you, it's an amazing group. It makes me very optimistic for this city to see people who are so excited and so committed. Um, and the first thing we did was come in here and start asking questions and start listening. Um, the key here is the residents of the city understand the needs of the city and the vision of the city much better than any consultant, much better than city staff can. So the first thing we did is we really gathered stakeholder groups together and started just asking questions. What's good about the city? What works? What's strong? What do we need to hang on to? What would we like to see change? What's missing? And bringing together groups like the council members and the mayor, the youth advisory committee, the Planning and Zoning Commission, Development Committee, developers who've built projects in Sugar Land, the school districts and the university, um, young professionals, area employers who are trying to attract people to jobs here and really ask them, what are the big issues you see? What are the big decisions we have to make going forward? And that then led to something I think is pretty extraordinary that happened in this room, which is a series of forums to really discuss those big issues. These were public events. Um, and what we did is we actually brought subject matter experts, both regionally and from across the country, to deal with, to talk about, to really look at precedents for and data about the big issues that are going to shape land use in Sugar Land for the next couple of decades. But we didn't just do this in order to bring people into this room and hear from experts. We did this to hear from everyone who attended. So I know some of you went to those forums. And what happened there is we did a presentation in this room. And then we adjourned next door to sit around tables and talk about what did we learn from this? What are the takeaways from the city of Sugarland from what we just heard? Um, and we got some pretty extraordinary information that really formed the basis of everything we did after that moving forward. So form number one was really looking at change. It was really looking at how is the world changing. And the world is changing in terms of the demographics of the American population. And the world is also changing in terms of what people's market preferences are, the kind of places people want to live in, the kind of places that people want to work in. And it was really interesting what came up. Um, we talked about housing choices. We talked about what does it mean when you have more older residents who want to be able to downsize and what choices do they have in the city. We talked about land use and transportation. But the biggest takeaway people said over and over again from this is change is inevitable. The world is changing around us and the city will change. And that ultimately what this process is about is what can the city do to guide that change? What can we do so that change is positive and not negative? The second forum was looking at employers. One of the successes here in Sugar Land has been attracting employers to the city, which builds the tax base, but I'd say even more importantly, makes the city a more desirable housing market because people increasingly really, really do want to live near where they work. And so we talked about what it takes to do that. Safe, high quality neighborhoods are a big part of the reason why those employers have been attracted to Sugar Land. But we're also talking about how the workplace is really changing, how amenities are becoming more and more important. And people want to work at a company where they can walk out of their office and walk to a coffee shop across the street or get drinks after work. And that employers are starting to look for that when they are selecting locations. That's part of the reason why Minute Maid moved into town square here because they saw the amenities around them that made it a more attractive location for their business. And then in number three, we talked about creating thriving active places, what it takes in terms of design and what it takes in terms of activities and a mix of uses to really create the kind of place 
where people gather, where people want to spend time, exactly what you see outside the doors right here, a, a place where people want to be, where there's activity going on at different times of the day. And how much the shape of buildings, how much retail strategy really creates these places. Um, and once again, the takeaways here, one of the things we heard over and over again was people saying, what I'd love to be able to do is walk out of my house and walk down the street and get a coffee. The idea of I don't want to have to drive in order to be able to get everywhere I go. And we heard from a lot of people saying we really want these amenities in the city. We want a city that has good places to eat um, and the importance of all of that. Number four, we talked about housing choices. The realization that we're, we're going to be a country where the majority of households do not have children at home. And we have tended to develop only one kind of house. We've tended to develop only single family house on a large lot. And the reality is there's people who are looking to downsize. They're looking for a smaller house, a smaller single family house. They may be looking for a townhouse. They may, may be looking for multifamily. But what they're looking for above all of that is the character of the place that the most important measure isn't density, is something people told us over and over again here. The most important measure is actually what a place feels like, what it's designed like. And then mobility and land use, where we really talked about how traffic works in a place like this. We talked about why is it that the intersection of, of 69 and State Highway 6 bogs down? What is it about how the city has been designed, and how land uses are placed around that street infrastructure that really shapes how people can move around the city. And what do you have to do to offer choices? And I'll talk about that a little more later, but one of the really interesting things is basically everyone who went said, we need to, cars are gonna be a crucial part of the city moving forward. This is going to be a city where you can get everywhere you want to by car, and we want to support that. But we want to have the option to move around in other ways too. We want to have the option to bike. We want to have the option to walk. And that's even for short trips. That, that can be, I'd like to park once and do multiple things when I park once. And number six, we talked about redevelopment. This was one of the sort of surprises that came up when we did a lot of stakeholder sessions because in a lot of ways, Sugarland's really a very young city. But those parts of Sugarland that there were developed in the 70s and 80s really aren't that young anymore. And you're starting to see the signs of commercial real estate that seems to be not holding its value. And people were concerned and said, if, if I draw that trend line, what does this look like 10 or 20 years from now? And do we need to start talking about redevelopment? And so that was really the big theme in this one. What are the opportunities for redevelopment in the suburban context? How can you redevelop really commercial property in a way that builds the value of that property and builds the value of everything around it? And we saw some really compelling examples of what's possible there. And based on all of that feedback, we developed a set of vision and goals that really said, this is our goals for the city in terms of land use moving forward for the next couple of decades. And so we were done with those roughly around October 2014. And it's worth mentioning the structure of what we're doing here. We start with a vision. That is the overall statement for where we want to go as a city in terms of land use. And that is supported by a series of goals. These goals are broad statements that say, this is where we want to get to. Within goals are policies, which are really statements of, this is how we want to get there. And then each policy leads to a set of specific actions. If you think about what the city does that influences land use, there are some direct actions. The city builds a project. The city builds a new performing arts center. The city extends a street. There are regulatory actions. The city adds something to the zoning code, adds something to the development ordinances. Um, there's planning activities, for example, saying we are going to evaluate a neighborhood where residents have concerns about how the character of that neighborhood is changing, and we're going to do a study to figure out what might be necessary for the city to do in order to protect that neighborhood. So that's the city initiating a planning process. And finally, there's guidance. There's 
what happens when a developer submits a plan to the city and planning and zoning has to respond to that plan. And under a PUD district, there's no strict written rules on how to respond to that plan. The question for planning and zoning is really, is this in the character of what the city wants? And so this plan is also intended to, form, to be guidance in meeting those decisions so that when P&Z is sitting there considering that plan, they can say, we like this plan because it does this. We do not like this plan because it does not do this. And so that's the basic structure of what we're doing. And you will see all of that out there on the boards. We've already had a public meeting to really consider those goals. But today we're showing you specific policy statements and we're showing you some of the actions that support those policy statements. And we want your feedback on that. And as a background to that, I want to talk about some of the big ideas that are really in this plan. Um, I also want to note that we've really vetted this against a lot of things. We've vetted everything you see against the specific feedback we got from the public. And we've vetted everything you see against the city's comprehensive plan. And we really actually went through on a very detailed level and said, how does all of this add up? And what we found is we believe that what you will see out there is really in conformance with what the council has already adopted as the city's comprehensive plan and very much matches the feedback we got from the public when we've given the public the opportunity to have input. So like I said, we already held our first public meeting December of 2014. That was really focused on the vision and the goals. Today you're going to see a greater level of detail. And there's really three big ideas that I want to mention to you that I think are worth understanding. And if you understand these three, you really understand a lot of our goals here. The first idea is the idea of an activity center. And quite simply put, you are in one of those right now. Sugarland Town Square here is an activity center. And let me talk about what makes a good activity center. And these are essentially, as we see it, the requirements for it. An activity center is not simply a cluster of a certain number of jobs. An activity center is about how a place is built. And it's actually about being a place, not just a collection of buildings, but a place. So first of all, an activity center has mixed uses. It has multiple uses placed together. And I will say that one of our big recommendations from this plan is that commercial uses do not work well in isolation. Office-only areas with no supporting amenities, with no supporting retail, are not as successful as office areas that have that retail. And likewise, we don't believe that multifamily in isolation works very well either. That what will hold the long-term value of that multifamily is actually it being within walking distance of jobs, being within walking distance of restaurants, having value due to the place that it's in. So a successful activity center is the kind of place where you can go and do multiple things in the same place rather than having to get in your car every time you do one thing and then drive to the next. So if you think about where we're standing right here, we're in a civic building. Across the street from us are offices and a hotel and retail. Right next door to us is multifamily. And it is all integrated together. These aren't isolated pods. They are all mixed together. And critically, it is designed to be pedestrian friendly. It is designed so that if I want to go to Starbucks over there, by far the most pleasant and enjoyable way to do it is to walk. Because what's between here and there is a great, walkable, enjoyable public space. And what's interesting about that is this is one of the best solutions we have to traffic. If you think about State Highway 6 out here, we can't really widen it. We can't really build a parallel. University Boulevard was the best relief that we'll ever get. But if you look at the traffic that's happening there, some of that is long distance traffic. It's people driving from Sugar Land to their jobs in the Galleria. But an amazing amount of that is short distance traffic. And I'm sure you can recognize that day on the left, the day when you drive from home to work, and then you drive to lunch, and then you drive to go to a boutique to buy a gift, and then you drive to the stationery store to buy a card for that gift, and then you have to go by the grocery store to get some food, and then you drive home. And you add all of that together, and that's seven car trips. 
seven short car trips, every one of them adding traffic to the road. If some of those things are just gathered together, if you can go to that boutique just straight from your work before you get in your car, if you can walk to lunch, that stationary store and the grocery store are together, we've taken those seven trips and made them three trips. You're still driving to get around, but you're doing a lot less trips and you're doing a lot less of that local traffic that really tends to gum up our streets. Another important attribute of activity centers is the idea of public space. It's what we see out here. It is the places where you can gather, where you can meet your friends, where you can have public events. It is the places that actually define the city because the city is defined by the people in it. And these are the places where those people meet. Um, and so compelling, active, interesting public spaces are a key part of what makes an activity center a good activity center. So places like that, you can think about city center in Houston, where I'm sure a lot of you have been. This is a place that combines a hotel, it combines offices, it combines a conference center, retail, restaurants, multifamily, a nice plaza in the middle, and just think about how active that is. Think about how much people enjoy being there. And think about what it means if you work there and everything that's available to you right around your office. You can think of the woodlands the whole woodlands waterway area, where once again you have all of those uses mixed together, all within walking distance of each other. And if you look across the state, you can see places like the Domain in Austin. It's a retail center, it's an employment center, it's a place where you can live. And all of that in a walkable, connected activity center. You can think about places like Addison Circle. If you go up to the Dallas area, you see a whole lot of these places in, in cities that are very much like Sugarland that are saying we are building essentially downtowns. We are building these little, the equivalent of the small town downtown, these little centers within our city. And what we have done is we've identified where we think these centers are within Sugarland. Every one of these is an existing commercial area. We're in one of them right now. We've got Lake Point across the freeway. We've got the sort of Sugar Creek Triangle between 59 and 90. We've got University Boulevard and we've got Imperial. Every one of these already exists. Every piece of property we are showing within them is either undeveloped land or existing commercial property. And every one of these is placed on a major regional connection because part of the definition of activity centers is they draw people regionally. Workers will commute there regionally. People will travel regionally to go to events, to go to a Skeeters game, to go to a concert. And so they are on those major arteries and they are very much designed not to impact single family neighborhoods. These are places where that development can happen and where it will not impact adjacent single family, where we can buffer it from single family, where traffic will not flow through single family. The second idea is the neighborhood center. And this is a very different scale. The activity center is a place where you might come to from a different part of this region. People from Houston may drive there. The neighborhood center is really a place that serves its immediate surroundings. It's a place near your house where you might be able to grab a coffee. It's a place where there might be a dentist's office upstairs. It is much smaller. Think of this as a old small town main street, the way walkable neighborhoods have these little clusters, a place like the Heights where you have a little cluster of restaurants and small offices. Um, and here's a good example from Colorado. What you see here is a single family neighborhood that in the middle of it has this small business district, a couple of cafes, some professional offices upstairs. You can see a sort of recreation center and park just next to it. It's a center for that neighborhood. It's a place where people can walk to. People from other neighborhoods won't really be coming here. It's really supported by what's immediately around it. And what's great about this is it can really add a lot of value to that neighborhood. It makes this a more desirable place to live. There's a reason this developer included this here. And the reason they included it is, is it'll help sell those homes. And what's interesting when we think about this is it's really an ability, an opportunity to redevelop. We have places in Sugarland or we have existing strip retail that, like I said, you're starting to see vacancies. You project that forward and you can imagine in your minds an awful lot of places in this region where you see declining commercial areas that are going vacant, that are going low rent, and that has a very negative impact on the neighborhoods around them. 
The idea here is this is an opportunity to redevelop those places to actually add value to the adjacent neighborhood. So that rather than the thing at the entrance to the neighborhood being a blight, it's actually an amenity. And so that you, those might include, like I said, retail. They might include small offices. They might include denser forms of housing like townhouses or smaller lot single family homes that complement what's adjacent to them. This is not a place where you'd see a five story multifamily. This is a place that's on a much smaller scale and really designed to be linked to the neighborhood around it. So that's the second concept, neighborhood centers. We don't think we have a comprehensive list of these because fundamentally a neighborhood center will be created when a neighborhood sees the need and when a developer has a piece of property they want to develop. But this gives you an idea of the kind of places within the city that might become these kind of neighborhood centers. Generally, what we're looking at here is existing commercial property that has an opportunity to either redevelop or infill to add more uses to it. And the final concept, and one I really want to stress, is I showed you that map right there. In fact, if you look at this, everything in yellow on this map is single family. The vast majority of the land within the city of Sugarland is single family neighborhoods, and those will always be the heart of the city. And the key is to preserve their value. You can think of plenty of places in the Houston region where you see single family neighborhoods that are 30 or 40 years old, where you really see property turning rental, you see absentee landlords, you see maintenance going down. That's not happening in Sugarland, and we don't want it to happen in Sugarland. And one of the express goals of this plan is to really preserve the value of the single family neighborhoods of the city of Sugarland. We can do that in a lot of ways. Some of it is very specific targeted programs. Like I mentioned, it may be a specific plan for a specific neighborhood looking at are the city programs and ordinances that are in place protecting this neighborhood. But it's also adding value to the city as a whole. People want to live in a place that's near near jobs, that's near attraction. So the idea is, if we make the city as a whole attractive, that strengthens all the neighborhoods within it. And that's really one of the big goals here. So those are the big ideas here. And what we want now is your input. This plan is, at this point, still very much a draft. And the reason we are having this meeting is we want to hear from you on what's in here. We haven't actually started writing this chapter of the comprehensive plan yet because we wanted to get your input before there's a draft document. Ultimately, this is going to go to city council. Um, after we refine these policies you've seen here, after we document this, and then there'll be a review and approval process in terms of city council. The other thing to remember is all of these specific actions require their own approval. So any recommendation we make to change zoning, that is going to have to go through the process of a zoning change, which will have its own opportunities for public input at that point. So this is the overall framework. And every individual recommendation within it is going to have to go through its own approval process. And that, this being a long-term plan, that's not all going to happen at the same time. In fact, one of the things we're asking you for is priorities. Which items do you think it is worth the city moving ahead on quickly, and which items are less important. So we want your feedback in a couple of different ways. Out here in the lobby, there are stations for each of the goals within this plan. And under those goals are a series of policy items, and we want your comments on those policies. So go to those stations, you will meet city staff members of the consultant team, as well as members of the Land Use Advisory Council. They'll answer your questions, they'll listen to your comments, and you can put those comments on a post-it note and put those right on the board so that we really gather all of that information. There's also a board that has specific actions on it. These are really the key actions we've identified which implement these policies. And what we want to know is what are your priorities? Show us which actions you think are most important that the city should move forward with. And you've, we've given you dots to mark those with. So mark your top three priorities there. And then we also have comment cards. We know some of you will have specific concerns about specific goals and specific policies. We know some of you will have more detailed comments. And that's what those comment cards are for. You can, next to every one of those policy statements, 
say whether you agree with it or you're concerned about it or you don't care, and we've given you room to elaborate on why you think that. We are going to go through all of this in detail so that we make sure that we're moving forward with something um, that really meets the needs and the desires of the residents of Sugarland. And then finally, if you go to Sugarland website, you have, you have the opportunity to leave comments online as well. We've had multiple of those opportunities already, and here's another opportunity for you to make specific comments about what's in front of you. It's really important. This is a process which is about the next 30 years of this city, and it's about one of the most important things that the city does, because these are the policies that shape the place where you all spend your lives, and we know how much that matters to you. And that's why we're having this meeting today, and that's why your feedback is so important. So with that, I really want to stop talking and let you get to that. So I will hand it off to Lisa for the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. And I also would be remiss if I didn't point out that we did have some uh, other representatives of council and uh, the state as well. Please join us. So we had council member Jaju, please. And we have Representative Rick Miller also with us joining us. So thank you for taking the time. So also wanted to make sure that you uh, leave here armed with where you can find uh, more information about the processes that we've gone through and how you can give additional feedback. So uh, we, as Christoph mentioned, we do have a project uh, webpage that we've been maintaining uh, throughout the course of this project, and the, the link is up there. Um, we also... Um, um, you can go there for updates about the process as well as uh, a direct link to the online town hall, which Christoph mentioned, is another opportunity. So if there's something that you weren't able to give us this evening in, in terms of on the boards or the comment cards, um, it's some epiphany that you had uh, driving home tonight, um, that's another opportunity for you to uh, leave your comments with us on the online town hall.